Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Clinton Presidential Center. I'm Stephanie Street, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Clinton Foundation. Thank you all for joining us tonight as we welcome General Wesley Clark back to the center. And Mrs. Clark, it's always a great pleasure to have you with us uh, here as well. Tonight's program is being presented by the Clinton Foundation and the Clinton School of Public Service. Each year, the Clinton Center hosts a number of dynamic speakers as part of our ongoing commitment to offering exceptional programs to our community. And it's hard to imagine a speaker more dynamic than General Clark. I consider it a great privilege to introduce him this evening. General Clark graduated first in his class at West Point and received degrees at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. He is a retired four-star general in the United States Army and served as Supreme Allied Commander Europe, where he led NATO forces to victory in Operation Allied Force, the war in Kosovo. He is chairman and CEO of Wesley Clark & Associates, a strategic consulting firm, and is a senior fellow at the Burkle Center for International Relations at UCLA. General Clark serves as a member of the Clinton Global Initiative's Energy and Climate Change Advisory Board, and I'm proud to say he is the founding board chair of City Year Little Rock. He is also the recipient of many awards, including the Purple Heart and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. This evening, General Clark will be discussing his latest book, Don't Wait for the Next War, a strategy for American growth and global leadership. And following his lecture, he will answer some of your questions. Nikolai DePippa, Director of Public Programs for the Clinton School, will help moderate that discussion. And after the Q&A, General Clark will be signing copies of his books. I must say, the perfect holiday gift. Now, please join me in welcoming General Wesley Clark. Well, thank you all so much for being here. I'm, I'm really uh, honored that you came, and um, I've got a lot of things I'd like to talk about, but maybe I should start with the book. You came here, you knew I wrote a book. So uh, I'll, I want to tell you a little about the book, and I want to tell you why I wrote it, and, uh, and tell you then kind of what it means in the context of current affairs. So um, I met these people from the Syrian opposition uh, almost two years ago now, out in Los Angeles. And when I talked to them, they were seeking help from the United States. And I realized that it was impossible to answer the question of, should we help them, without putting it into context. And then I realized that I couldn't explain what the context was. I knew we were coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan, and I was worried about China, and so I tried to think about what should be done. And um, in the process, it occurred to me that we really don't have a strategy that most Americans can understand or explain. And so um, I wrote a book. Now. I'm not sure this is the right strategy. I know the book is what I believe, but like all strategies, it's just a book. The real strategy has to come from the hearts and minds of the American people themselves. And we've always had a hard time doing that in America. We're a big country. We were always told by George Washington, by every other president, stay away from foreign entanglements. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville came over here and said, you know, it's a democracy, and democracies don't do foreign policy very well. They can't go through all of the intricate machinations. They can't keep their plans secret. They can't think long term. They just sort of drift from crisis to crisis and election to election. And that's been America's history. The title of the book is Don't Wait Till the Next War, because that's what we always do. We wait till the next war. So I couldn't have written this book if I didn't have three crucial experiences. I had the military experience, I had a political experience, and uh, I want to thank you all who supported me in that political experience. It was a great experience, and I've had it over 10 years in the business community at a high level. So uh, Stephanie mentioned, you know, I've been a four-star general. I came up through the ranks. I was a 
lieutenant and a, and a captain, and I fought in Vietnam, and I came home on a stretcher, and I taught at West Point, and I helped as a captain. I was in the Pentagon working the, the mechanics of uh, moving to a volunteer army, and I did all the army things that you do. I was a battalion, company commander three times. I was a battalion operations officer, a brigade executive officer, a battalion commander, brigade commander, uh, division staff officer, assistant staff officer, division commander, uh, and ultimately the director of strategic plans and policies in the Pentagon. I worked as assistant executive officer to General Alexander Haig when he was the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. I'd been a White House fellow. I was in the Ford White House, so I saw that operation in place. And um, so, and I, I knew people from across, and I wrote articles, and I would go to conferences, and people like uh, Richard Pearl and and, um, and Frank Wisner and uh, Paul Wolfowitz, I knew from these conferences in the 1980s. So I was a sort of military defense intellectual, but I spent most of my time actually as a senior officer, actually with troops. From 1976 until 1994, there's a period of 18 years, and I think all but three years, I was actually wearing uh, fatigues, battle dress uniform, or desert camouflage or something, and actually either commanding units, being a staff officer in units, or commanding units that were training other units. And uh, so at one point, I was the most powerful colonel in the Army. I got to evaluate division and corps commanders in front of the chief of staff of the Army. It was so bad that one two-star went into the chief and said, I'm not going to put up with Colonel Clark and his phony evaluations. You know it's canned. He already knows what we're going to do. He fixes it so the enemy beats us and embarrasses us. And actually, the chief of staff of the Army, it wasn't true. The chief of staff of the Army got very angry at this guy. And actually, although he was subsequently promoted to three stars, he never had a command position again with troops. And he retired as a three-star after a sort of, I mean, you can't be mad if you retire as a three-star, but I'm sure he thought he was going to be a four-star. And, um, and so he didn't make it. And uh, so I had, uh, I, I was the guy who, who, who called the shots. So it was a controversial career. It was a great career, and I worked for a lot of great people. And so I really understood the military. And then I had this amazing experience in politics. I never thought I'd be in politics, really. I mean, I never ran for student class officer, and I mean, I could never see the point of it. You know, I mean, people would, I, I, what would you, what, 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 they're not serving the right lunch and meat in the cafeteria, the parking lot needs to be paved. I think that was the issue in Hall High School, wasn't it, Jeannie? The parking lot gets our cars dirty and dusty. Really? You're lucky enough to have a car in high school? Not bad for 1960, 62, you know? But, uh, so I never did any of that. And, um, and so after I got out of the military, I had a contract, a standby contract with CNN, and they didn't use me. But then 9-11 came along, and suddenly I was on television every day. And, uh, and then uh, I was asked my opinion on things. And um, in the summer of 2002, I was asked by the, the Times of London, would I write an op-ed on whether the United States should invade Iraq? My wife heard this, and she said, Wes, don't write this. She said, this is going to get you in trouble. It's a mistake. And I said, no, no, honey, no, look. I, I, you, she said, no, you're going to say you don't, you don't think it's necessary. You're going to get everybody mad at you in the Pentagon, and, and then it's going to be a problem. I said, honey, I can, I'll write this nuanced. No one, it'll be just really smooth. And, and, and so sure enough, the next day, I was Ted Kennedy's favorite general. I was the general that was against the war in Iraq. Now, you wouldn't have believed that if you'd listened to Joe Lieberman attack me when I ran for president, but that's a different matter. So, uh, so I testified, and then John Kerry got prostate cancer, and before I knew it, people were calling me and asked me to run for president. Jimmy Carter called me, Madeleine Albright called me, uh, people from uh, around Bill and Hillary Clinton called me, and I, I, I didn't, I had a, they kept saying, you know, you need to do this. I said, but I, I have a job. I can't live without the job. And so if I, and I was trying to finish a second book, and if I, if I quit the job, then I can't live. People said, we'll figure out a way to get you paid. Well, you can't. You can't. And so um, 
eventually, I, I talked to a lot of people. I went to the Blue Dog Democrat Caucus up in Washington. At that time, there were 60 Blue Dog Democrats. I think there might be two now, <laughs> but there were 60. And they sat around the table in this big conference room in the Capitol, and they're saying, you know, and I, and I told them what I should, what I wanted to say, what I believed. And we went around the table, and one guy said, he says, now, General Clark, he said, you say we should be doing what, what we believe and should say what we believe is right. He said, but I only won my district by, by 51 to 49. What should I do? I said, well, it depends on whether you believe it's more important to say and do the right thing or to be reelected. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and I, I got, I had my brother-in-law come down here. Some of you met my brother-in-law, Gene Caulfield. He's a really common sense guy. And I hemmed and hawed around this thing. I talked to Gert. At first, Gert said, if you ever say this again, I'm going to kick you out of the bedroom. And then. So, but eventually, you know, my son said, you have to let dad run. But I was still, I didn't know, I called Joe Biden for advice. And Joe said, look, he said, I think you should run. I think you've got a one in three chance of winning the nomination. And if you win the nomination, you'll beat George Bush. I said, Joe, um, well, my wife doesn't want me to run. Why don't you run? He said, my wife doesn't want me to run either. <laughs> so uh, finally, it was Monday morning, the 15th of September, 2003, and Gert was up to go out for a walk. And she said, OK, I'm going for a walk, and uh, you're going to have to make a decision, because I was going to be in Iowa for, for a speech on Thursday night. She said, you're going to have to make a decision on this. And uh, she said, I'll go for a walk, and when you come back, make the decision. When I'm, when I'm back, make the decision. I knew I was eventually going to have to make this decision because, you know, on one side it was incredibly exciting, on the other side it was daunting and I was going to have to give up finance and, and live off savings and it was, it was kind of scary. And I knew there'd be a lot of personal attacks because that's what politics is all about. It's all personal. So Gert left the house and I sat down in front of, on my desk, I opened up the Bible and, um, and I read the 55th Psalm because that's the Psalm I always read when I need guidance. And I read it. I focused on every word, I put my head down on the desk, and I prayed. And sometimes when you pray, you know, if you do, sometimes you get a little tingle and you say, that, that, this, is, this feels right, you know? And I kept saying, what should I do, what should I do? I have never gotten less from prayer than I got then. <laughs> I mean, it was the really important question. I got nothing. It was like totally dark. And I tried. I was just, I, 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 finally I put my head up. I said, I'm not getting anywhere. So I read the 56th Psalm. <laughs> and um, and I, as I put my head down to pray, and I'm praying, dear God, please give me an indication, uh, some sign, some feeling about what I should do. Suddenly the phone rings, and it's the desk phone. I couldn't turn it off with a Click, I picked it up, I said, General Clark speaking. The deep male voice on the other end said, Wes, <clears throat> Wes, you must run. I said, I said, who is this? He said, no, listen, listen, you must run. I said, I know, but who is it? So this was Tom Johnson, the former head of CNN. And so, you know, I'm looking at my watch, I've got like 15 minutes to make a decision. And I said, okay, 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 I got it. Thanks, thanks very much. I put my head back down. About that time, the computer went off with AOL. It says, Bing, you, you've got mail. I look at it, and it's an email from a guy in DC. It says, don't do what Colin Powell did. He, he, he got everybody ready. He got a lot of support, and then he backed out. He said, you've got a lot of support. Go ahead and run. It's important. And I'm thinking, God, that's two messages. And about that time, the door opened, and Gert was back earlier from the walk. She said, OK, what's the decision? I said, I, th I think I'm going to run. I said it in a really small, quiet voice. And, and I thought she was going to say, honey, you can't do that. Don't do it. She didn't say it. She said, OK. And she shut the door. And <laughs> I called the office, and I called a couple of people. I said, I think I've made the decision. I think we're going to, about that time, like 200 people parachuted into Little Rock. And that little office I was sharing with Raleigh Rimmel down there on Canfield Road was packed. 
And so we had five great months in the campaign. I got to 30 states. I got to meet people from all over America. I got to see how politics looks and feels on the inside. I got to meet the political press, or they got to meet me. It wasn't a happy meeting in every case, uh, and I learned a lot about how the media works in, in America. Not CNN and military media, but real political cynicism. So I learned that. We raised about $20 million, so I met a lot of wealthy people. I met governors and congressmen and senators. I realized every state's different. And maybe the best part of it was I got to really think about issues I never understood in the military, even though I taught them and seen them from a distance and as a White House fellow, because when you run for office and you have the support, I had a lot of great support from the Clinton people. And so I had Gene Sperling and Bob Rubin helping me with economics. I had Ron Klain. The, the, the Ebola czar now, who was formerly Vice President uh, Gore's chief of staff, he was vice president, he was, he, he's the guy who prepped me for my first debate. Uh, I had smart people, Sandy Berger, I could call anybody and get advice from them. So it wasn't just a matter of military now, I could talk about economics, I could talk about housing, I could talk about health care, I could talk about trade policy. I remember Sandy Berger said to me, you're not against free trade, are you? And we had this long, detailed discussion, and, and it was a, these were serious discussions where you could actually extract data. Jason Furman, who's now chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, he was my policy chief in my campaign. So I had top quality people, and it was a real education. And, um, and I kept it going afterwards. I kept a political action committee together for another four or five years. I campaigned for a lot of Democrats, gave a lot of political speeches, and got to see political America. And then. I got out of the campaign and went to, back to work into the investment banking business and on a bunch of boards in energy and finance and technology, startup companies, big companies, Goldman Sachs. I was a consultant to Goldman. Um, I chaired an investment bank on Wall Street. I'm on a dozen boards right now. I do business in China, um, Africa, Eastern Europe, the Gulf, uh, Western Europe, South America, Panama, Central America, and the United States and Canada. So uh, everywhere but Russia. I don't go to Russia, and I haven't been to India and Pakistan. But other than that, I, I sort of got the whole feel of this. And when I go into these countries for business, I always see like heads of state, presidents, or, or prime ministers, or ministers of economy and government, and you have these long searching talks about America. So it's been a really fulfilling, rich experience. And I couldn't have written a book without it. So that's what the book is. And I know, and I look out here, I see Bob Johnson and a lot of smart people in the audience, and, and, um, and I'm really honored that you're here. I tried to give back in this book. And, you know, I look at where the country is. We've got real problems right now. And um, those problems are three major interlocking geopolitical crises and an economy that's very, very shaking and a political system which is hardly functional at all. And people around the world are wising up to it. So let's talk about that, and then I'll tell you kind of what my solution is, and I'd love to take your comments and questions. And um, people have told me the book's pretty easy to read. I wrote it, it's 220 pages, and you can read it in three hours, just like this. It's, it's not hard. There's no sex. <laughs> There's no sex. I'm not telling tales on anybody, so it didn't make the bestseller list, and, and, I, and, and, and so uh, I haven't even been on Oprah for it, but I'd like to be. She just doesn't know how much I need to be on it. So if any of you have any connections with Oprah, please get me on that show. America needs to think about these issues. You see, what we have is um, a fascination with the Middle East. And I was there at the beginning when this got started. It, 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 it got started for not for necessarily strategic reasons, but for macho reasons and for political reasons. So. In 1991, when I was a one-star, I was in the office of Under Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz. And, and it was a Friday afternoon. It was May, and the war was over, and everybody was like this, you know. I didn't get to fight in the war, so I wasn't like that, but I was respectful. And, I, and, and, and Paul had come out during the time we were training the National Guard at the National Training Center, where I was the commanding general in California. So in January, he said, if you ever get to the Pentagon, come and see me and say hello. So, he probably said that to all, all the guys out there. 
So it was a Friday afternoon. There was nothing to do. I'd spent five minutes with Colin Powell, and he said, oh, thanks, and pushed me out the door. So I thought, okay, so uh, I'll try this guy Wolfowitz. So I go up there and uh, knock on the door, and uh, Scooter Libby opens the door and says, yeah, the secretary, undersecretary will see you. So I go back in there, and there's Paul in his office. He was the number three guy in the Pentagon, the undersecretary for policy. He's sort of sitting there Friday afternoon like a daze. He's, uh, he's, he's there at the desk, and I said, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, hello. You know, and he's like, oh, oh, hello, hello. And uh, I said, so you've got to be pretty proud of the troops, right? He said, yeah, he said, but he said, we didn't get Saddam. Now, President George H. Bush said his own people will take him out. I said, but I don't think so. He says, we should have gotten him. He said, but we did learn one thing. We learned we can use military force in the region with impunity, and the Soviets won't do a thing to stop us. Now, that was Paul Wolfowitz's lesson. I said, uh, wow. And he said, and we've got five, maybe 10 years to get rid of these old Soviet surrogate regimes like Saddam and like Syria before the next superpower comes along to challenge us. So that was my Friday afternoon nugget. And, um, and, and so that's where it started. I came back in the Pentagon in 94. During the Clinton administration, I asked the Under Secretary of Defense for policy then. When we were struggling to write a U.S. national strategy, I said, what about Wolfowitz's strategy? He said, huh, what's that? Yeah, no one ever heard of it. But Paul Wolfowitz kept it. And it was that strategy which reemerged after 9-11 and drove us into the Middle East. They doctored it up in a lot of ways. But today, if you talk about national security, Americans automatically think about the Middle East. I mean, they just, they're drawn to it like a magnet. National security fighting must be the Middle East. I remember talking to Condi Rice in the summer of 2000. And, um, and, and they'd already hatched this. I got out of, got out of the military, and, and Gert and I had talked about what, what I was going to do, and I'd gotten a job with Stevens, and I was writing a book on my experiences at NATO and working in Washington, and, uh, and I was getting calls from Democrats, and so I wanted to be nonpartisan. So I called up, um, I knew Colin Powell was working for George Bush, and so I called up Condoleezza Rice and said, I'd like to meet you, I haven't met you, and she said, oh, I'll come over and meet you. So she came right over to meet me, we sat and talked, and we disagreed on every single aspect of foreign policy. We spent one hour fighting with each other. I couldn't believe it. I mean, she was like, you messed up relations with Russia. We think Russia's really good, and we're going to work with Russia. They're going to help us. I said, no, I don't think they are. She said, well, you had no business doing the fighting you did in, in, in Europe. She said, our troops shouldn't even be there. They should be where we need to fight. I said, we need to fight where? Where is that? She said, the Middle East, of course. So at the end of the hour, we sort of said, oh, so nice to talk to you. She said, oh, yes, it's so good to talk to you. She said, I'm sure we'll see you again. I said, I'm sure you will. <laughs> so we, I realized there was no home for me with that crowd because they didn't understand the first thing about American strategy and policy and how the world is actually put together. They wanted to fight in the Middle East. And that's what we've been doing now for 14 years. It's been, it's been 13 and a half years since 9-11, and it's been continuous combat. And the trouble is we haven't resolved this. So the Middle East is there like a vacuum drawing us in. And then there are two other problems. There's a near-term problem with Vladimir Putin. When we wrote the national security strategy in the Clinton administration, I got there in 94. I came out of Fort Hood, Texas. I was a, just promoted to three stars. I walk into the Pentagon, and General Shali Kashvili says, OK, you will be the J-5. You're in charge of strategy and driving the staff. You will tell us what to do. He said, so what is the strategy? I thought it was like a test question or something. I said, well, sir, I, I, I don't know. He said, I do not know either. He said, go and talk to so-and-so and find out this strategy. So what I didn't realize is the Clinton administration was being creamed on the Hill by the Republicans for not having a strategy. So it took us a year and a half to write the strategy. And um, I got a little part of it. I got to mark it up and stuff. It was called a national security strategy. It was called a, 
a strategy of engagement and enlargement. Now, nobody ever paid any attention to it, and the title sounded like an advertisement for a men's pharmaceutical product. <laughs> but in fact, though, I mean, it identified four key threats that we had to work against. Even though there was no Soviet Union, they were gone. The threats were uh, regional instability. That's certainly been true. It was in the Balkans. It's in Africa. It's in the Middle East today. Uh, there were uh, what they called proliferation problems, nuclear proliferation. Well, that's what we've been worried about with North Korea and Iran for the whole time of the, since the turn of the century. There were what they called transnational problems, terrorism, international uh, drug trafficking, and organized crime. Well, boy, you know, you can underscore terrorism. We sure got that right. And the fourth problem was the problem we identified of a resurgent Russia. Now, we wrote that strategy in 94, 95. It's been 20 years since we were writing that strategy. It's taken Vladimir Putin a long time, but hey, we got it. Vladimir Putin thinks he can recreate the Soviet Union, and he thinks he can pull the wall over the West. What he thinks he can do is this. He thinks he can have a triple play, a win-win-win for him. That is to say, he's engaged with us in the Iranian nuclear negotiations. Okay, that's good, because what he can say to the White House is, hey, uh, you better be nice to me, because I've got a lot of influence with Iran. You know, I supply them all their nuclear stuff, and uh, if you don't want me to supply them the wrong stuff or give them, you know, nasty air defense that you can't penetrate easily, be nice to your friends in Moscow. So he thinks he's got leverage over us. Meanwhile, he's supplying weapons and missiles and so forth and supporting uh, Bashar Assad in his return to the Middle East. That's his footprint in the Arab world, and he wants Russia to be respected everywhere and consulted everywhere, and that means he's got to hang on to the Middle East. He thinks if he plays it right, the United States is going to bomb ISIS and not having our own forces in there, that Assad's forces will then take advantage of U.S. bombing and then be able to get rid of the rebels in Syria and run the country. Of course, at that point, they will not thank the United States. They will thank Russia for their support. And then he thinks because he still has leverage over us through the Iranian talks and because actually using sanctions is a very difficult problem. Now, if it's a little bitty country and an island and you can say, okay, we're cutting off all your food, water, and everything, you better do it our way, it might work. When it's Russia, and they're deeply embedded in the energy problems uh, and energy supply for the West, and Germany and Europe trade $400 billion a year worth of capital goods to Russia, and you say, hey, we're not going to trade with you guys anymore. Uh, okay, that's fine. It's like the robber comes to your house. You say, I got a pistol here, and if you don't get out of my house, I'm going to come up right next to you. I'm going to put this pistol up beside my head, and the bullet after I shoot it is going to go through your head. Now, you better leave. And so we're kind of in a difficult position on sanctions right now. And um, Putin thinks that if he can tough it out and jiggle the tree a little bit, you know, he's um, proposing a ceasefire, and he's proposing this, and he's helping with that, and he thinks eventually the Europeans, led by the Germans, will say, you know, the sanctions didn't work. Just, just give him Crimea. He can have Ukraine. Nobody likes him anyway. I mean, nobody even knows where Ukraine is. And, and anyway, they've always been part of Russia. And let's go back to business as usual. Putin sees all that. He's playing it. He's like, it's like he's got the modeling clay. He pushes a little here, puts it there, shapes it a little. He, he watches the political system. Yeah, Obama, he did really bad with Congress. I bet he doesn't want to go to war. Hey, Obama, remember, we got some new nukes. We're Russia. And he's flying those bombers around and saying, America's uh, in, really in trouble economically. They can't afford to raise their defense budget. They got something called sequestration. Let's put some more pressure on them by making them intercept our bombers and fly some stuff over the Gulf of Mexico. Putin has this, he thinks he has this figured out. So we have a Putin problem because the real problem behind this is we think we don't know actually what his ambitions are, but we think they might be unlimited. And that if we concede and give him what he wants, he doesn't 
feel full and happy and satisfied. Instead, it makes him hungrier and more anxious to take more. So across Eastern Europe, these nations that I talked to, I talked to the presidents and ministers of foreign affairs, so forth, they're shaking in their boots because if he gets away with what he's gotten away with in Ukraine and the Ukraine government falls and it could fall politically, economically, or militarily, then NATO will be put to a test like it's never been tested before because we've never had a defensive strategy in NATO. We always had a deterrent strategy. And Putin has a new generation of nuclear weapons. While we were talking about getting rid of our nuclear weapons, he was actually investing in nuclear weapons. And you may remember the old neutron bomb? Well, Putin actually has it. It's so good that if it goes off, the lawyers in Washington will be arguing for two weeks about whether it was actually a nuclear weapon or not. All it does is kill people. It hardly even blows down a building. It's a perfect weapon. You can use it on your own territory if the enemy attacks you, and you can use it against the enemy in front of you, and you can drive right through it. So uh, just don't get close to it when it goes off. And it can be fired by a cannon. So it's a little bitty thing like this. And uh, they've done really well. And as he said, he's got 5,000 of them now. He's been telling everybody this. And in the popular press, we haven't quite understood what this means, but this, what this means actually is that NATO's deterrent which we've taken for granted all these years, is at great risk in this crisis. So it, we're like the frog in the pot being boiled. The temperature's going up. We don't quite see it. Um, and we're not quite sure what the end result's going to be. But we need to turn off the heat in the Ukraine really quick. There's a third problem, and that problem is China. Now, China is not a crisis. China is a long-term uh, challenge to America. They will end the American century. That's their dream. The China dream is, the, is that America no longer has the American dream. It, it, it's, it's that the world is restructured to suit China. They've got four times the population. They're still doing pretty well. I know everybody says, oh, they're really having a hard time. Yeah, they're only growing like 6% a year, 7% a year. Too bad, huh? The Europe's not growing at all. And China's putting the money into its military. And China has said it wants its, its, its control of the South China Sea. Must be their sea anyway, because it's called the South China Sea, so must be theirs. And uh, they published a, li a line in 1949, said, hey, this is the South China Sea, it's ours. And they're building islands and putting out their forces and demanding that they have it. So uh, we've got a long-term push from China. What makes it tricky is China has a long-term strategy. They're not Putin. They know exactly what they're doing. They've been doing it for 35 years. It's a very simple strategy. It's get America to give you technology, investment, and educate your kids. And then we'll take America's jobs, we'll take their money, we'll use their money to buy up resources to support China, we'll use their technology to build our economy, and then when everything's done, we'll convert that economy into military power, and that's the, that's the end of the American century. That's coming. The Chinese believe this decade is their window of opportunity. So that challenge is coming on us really quick. So that's the problem in a nutshell. And there are five other problems got to work at the same time. Cybersecurity, terrorism, financial system stability. You know, some people think the decline in the price of oil is a good thing. But 17% of the debt held in the American financial system is associated with oil companies. And the value of much of that debt has declined markedly. Since the 1st of October, most of the debt has gone down by 50% in value. Some of the debt's held in banks. Some of it has been packaged and sold to other financial institutions like insurance companies and so forth. They're all going to suffer. And you know what happens when Wall Street suffers? Wall Street then starts selling, and, the, and it spreads into other industries and other sectors because they have to make payments and they have to do other things. So the market was down 315 points today, was down a couple of hundred points, came halfway back earlier in the week. 
Uh, we're trying to figure out this energy crisis. Meanwhile, we still have national debt. The economy's not growing the way it should. We're still not creating the kind of jobs we should be creating for America's middle class. Democrats and Republicans can't work together, and people around the world say, what's this about for America? So that's what the book's about. Now, there's an answer to this. We've got to fix the economy. We've got to restore wage rates for America's middle class families. We've got to have interest rates high enough so that people can earn money off their savings, and we've got to encourage Wall Street to make investments in real things rather than in things like uh, check cashing organizations. One of the last things we looked at in Goldman Sachs when I was up there was payday lenders. Hey, Wes, what do you think? We should invest in these payday lenders? Are you kidding me? Why don't we invest in real things that produce real value? Why don't we build things in this country? Uh, because uh, financial engineering, I mean, I've got this money and I've got to get a return on it in three years. And uh, how long is it going to take you to build it? And when do I get my money back? And uh, so there's a lot of real short-term thinking out there. There's a lot of stock buybacks on the market. I mean, I know you all like Apple, but Apple leads the world in spending its profits on buying back its own stock instead of investing in things or inventing new technologies. It just buys its stock back. It's a total waste. In fact, in, before 1982, stock buyback was illegal. So we've got some significant economic challenges in front of us, and we've got to fix it. I think if we can invest in America's energy future and become energy independent, then we can, uh, we can solve much of the problems facing us. We've got the technology, we've got the natural resources, we've got the finance. Right now, we're under attack by Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia saw it coming. Saudi Arabia says, oh, we don't want America to be energy independent because then they won't come fight for us. So let's bust that American energy boom that's going on. So that's what's actually happening. It's a deliberate economic attack on the United States of America by the government of Saudi Arabia. They're going to bust our energy sector. Now, uh, I know you're enjoying the low price of gasoline, but, but I promise you, if the Saudis succeed, you won't enjoy it because it's connected through the financial system to a lot beyond that. So we've got some real challenges to work with. We know how to do it. We know how to bring our economy back online. If we do that, we put a carbon tax in so we can deal with climate change, and then we'll be the leaders in the world economically, in climate change, and we'll have the power to deal with China, Russia, and the Middle East. So that's the, that's the book, that's the message, and um, I really thank you for coming tonight. I'd, be, I'd love to hear your questions or comments. Thank you. If Robert. you were president, what would you do about Putin, Ukraine, Crimea, and Eastern Ukraine? Well, I, I think the question is, what does it take to, to restore stability in Eastern Europe? And so I think you need political measures, you need economic measures, and you may need some military measures as well. So what we have done thus far is we've uh, made strong statements of support for our NATO allies. We've condemned Russia's action. We've sent the vice president to Ukraine twice to tell the Ukrainians and the world that we believe that Ukraine, when it stands for democracy and freedom, we believe in it. Um, we're talking about an economic aid package for Ukraine. We've helped Ukraine negotiate uh, natural gas, uh, but now it's short coal and uh, it's short money and the Ukrainian uh, currency is under uh, prolonged assault. So that's going to be a touch and go all winter. And then there's the military side. So um, a lot of our intelligence is actually directed at the Middle East. So it's been hard for U.S. intelligence to get precision reading on what's happening in Ukraine. I've been over there five times, and, uh, and I think that what we've seen is actually uh, a Russian invasion of Ukraine. These are not separatists. These are Russian forces using the most modern military equipment. And three days in August, um, they destroyed about 30 percent of Ukraine's military. 
Uh, I've seen pictures of the bodies. They used cluster munitions. They used fuel air explosives, which are like napalm, and, uh, and they're supposed to be prohibited. Uh, and they used uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, drones, to do the targeting for this. The Ukrainians had nothing, they, they had nothing that could, could help them. So Ukraine was unable to secure its own territory. I was over there uh, about four weeks ago, and the Russian forces were pouring across the border again. At that point, there were 8,000 um, Russians inside eastern Ukraine, 40,000 on the border, and um, it looked like action was imminent. Now, um, the only action that's taken place in the last week is a, that I know of is a big attack on the Donetsk airport uh, by Russian uh, special forces. And um, according to Ukrainian reports, they, they were repulsed with very heavy losses. The Ukrainians told me when I was there, said, you Americans, you have to understand how intense this is. We've lost more Ukrainians in six weeks than you Americans lost in combat in Iraq in eight years. And um, I also, you know, talked to, when I was in Ukraine, I, people, I mean, Ukraine is like, to Russia is like maybe Arkansas is to Texas or something. I mean, it's not that far away, and people know each other, and they're related, and they traveled. And uh, over 4,000 Russians have died in this fighting. And Putin has tried to keep it from the Russian people. So uh, it's a severe problem for Putin. The question is, is this enough of a problem to deter him? I don't know. So Congress has passed a bill uh, mandating uh, that the administration provide uh, military assistance to Ukraine. They've asked for military assistance. It hasn't been done yet. I hope the administration will look very closely at this uh, and, and consider the consequences. For me, I think that the surest way to push a resolution on the political path is to close the door for any further military success on the part of the Russians. Uh, and that's that's the issue, and our government is going to be thinking about it. Uh, yes, my name is Ramirez Beto. I'm a class nine student here at the Clinton School. First of all, thank you for visiting with us. Thank you. Uh, my question, I have two questions. One, on the right, they've been making a big deal about the Keystone XL pipeline and how much it will create jobs. In actuality, it probably will only create a couple of thousand. Why isn't that there isn't a same validity or, or same drumbeat on the on the political left to invest in America's infrastructure because it was only meant to last maybe 50, 60 years and a lot of our infrastructure is over 100 years old. I don't know how we can be a 21st century economy with with 100 year old infrastructure. Second, uh, in respect to American foreign policy, in the 1990s, it was mostly geared towards Europe and NATO expansion and European Union inclusion. Uh, in the 2000s, it's been, like you said, mostly focused in the Middle East. But we've fallen off in trying to use American soft power to create a democratic society globally. And whenever we did try to do that, it was by military force. So how do we use American soft power to not only create a democratic society and teach democracy around the world, but also reduce the, help to reduce the influence of China and Russia globally? You know, two really great questions. So let me answer the first one. I think, I think there is no comparable um, interest group focus on, on building infrastructure. I know there should be. You would think the highway lobby and people like this would be out there beating the drum, but they don't. For whatever reason, infrastructure contracts are given on competitive bid. Uh, most of them are, it's a very diffuse group. These people compete with each other. And although everybody says it's a good idea to do infrastructure, in fact, when we tried to do it in 2009 and people said, hey, we got shovel-ready projects, we actually did a pretty poor job with the shovel-ready projects. They really weren't ready. Some of them still weren't done. 12, 12 18, 20 months later, they hadn't, been, they hadn't been completely bidded out. So the money wasn't even starting to be committed. So it's a long, tough process, and there's just not the backing for it. There may be some partisanship in that as well. 
A lot of the push against the Keystone Pipeline is because there are environmental organizations that, you, let's be honest, if you're an organization, you need a cause to raise money, Keystone's a good cause. It will create some jobs in America, especially construction jobs early on. It doesn't really solve our energy independence problem unless you think someone was going to sink ships and not let us get oil because that oil is coming from Canada. Last time I checked, it's a different country. And so when you buy Canadian oil, although I like my friends in Canada and I'm on the board of Canadian companies, it's not helping the United States economy. It's money that's going out of the economy. So I'm I'm not a big proponent of the Keystone Pipeline. Now, um, I don't know whether you could create a strong constituency for infrastructure, but a lot of the people who are the contractors and the businesses who do this are people who traditionally support the Republican Party. And the Republican Party traditionally has supported infrastructure, but now it's been seized by a group further to the right who are paralyzed by the concept of taxes and they just want to minimize the role of government. So it's left important infrastructure projects in the lurch. Nobody knows quite how to do it. They don't want to build all toll roads. Public doesn't want that. But on the other hand, they don't seem to have the money and the wherewithal to raise the other means or to raise the bond issues to finance uh, the infrastructure projects that are needed. Now, your second question had to do with American foreign policy. And this is one of the things I've discovered. We're missing some key tools in our toolkit for American foreign policy. We have a good military, and we like to use it. It's well-funded. It's strongly supported by both parties. And uh, if you talk about national security, it's a pretty compelling argument on the Hill. And so typically, you can get your budget through. Um, if you want to do diplomacy, well, it doesn't cost much. It's more contentious, but <clears throat> secretaries of state have done a pretty good job. Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton did an excellent job in terms of getting more resources for the Defense Department, uh, sorry, for the State Department. But there's still a missing component of our policy. China is buying its way into Africa. China just announced a, I think it was a $40 billion fund for developing infrastructure in Eurasia to pull Eurasia closer to China. You see, we don't do that. We don't have a sovereign fund that can expend things. Now, if you go to Texas and Rick Perry likes you, he has a sovereign fund. And uh, some people call it a slush fund. He calls it a development fund. But he uses it to bring the right industries into Texas. And uh, Governor Beebe has talked about the importance of this. And I think we're going to do some of that in Arkansas, and I hope we will. But for some reason, as a nation, we can't seem to get our act together. So what we do is um, we broadcast appeals for democracy. We train people in how to monitor polls and how to organize political parties. And we uh, give away fax machines and cell phones and training for lawyers and civil and human rights organizations all over the world. And we're accused of destabilizing countries. Putin doesn't like it. China doesn't like it. In fact, there was some rumor that we were behind the Hong Kong disturbances. But what's missing in our foreign policy, we have an informational component, a diplomatic component, and a military component. We don't have a good economic component of foreign policy. So when countries like Romania, which I'm very familiar with because I work there a lot, become independent, they can't turn to the United States for help. The United States says, oh, just have a free market and, uh, and, and let companies come in. And I'm sure the free market will take advantage of your low wages and high education. And I bet you'll get a lot of companies here. So these companies go to Romania and said, we're thinking about building a factory here. Can you guarantee us that your workers won't make more than $2,000 a month? Can you give us no taxes for the first 10 years of our operation? Can you give us freedom from all customs duties? So by the time this negotiation's finished, it's just like when they come to Arkansas and say, we might locate an automobile factory in your state, but we don't want to pay any taxes. We want you to pay us to come here. We want you to pay to train the people, and we want to take the profits and invest them somewhere else. Now, how soon can you tell us how much you're going to give us to locate here? And so it's not terribly helpful. It's very competitive. What we need is a sovereign wealth fund or something like that, where we can go to a country and and be the tip of the spear in terms of sparking private sector investment in a country.
could be in Africa, it could be in the Middle East, it could be uh, in Eastern Europe or in, in Asia. We just don't have that fund. I asked myself, what if we had taken that Social Security Trust Fund, which was in surplus for 20 years after Alan Greenspan raised Social Security rates in 1984, 85? What if instead of investing in U.S. debt, we had actually invested in real assets that were going to yield a real return for the people of the United States and built dams and so forth. I look at the great dreams this country had during the 1930s, during the Depression, when we actually built things like Hoover Dam. And you ask yourself today, are we going to build another Hoover Dam anytime soon? Are we going to send a man to the moon anytime soon? Where's that great dream? And how do we get the resources to do it? We don't seem to have that ability inside our government anymore, and we haven't captured the imagination of the American people. Newt Gingrich said the way to do it was to send 13,000 people to the moon and establish a colony. <laughs> Newt Gingrich is a friend of mine. I got a Christmas card from him just today. And, um, but I don't support 13,000 people in a colony on the moon. We got to have economic wherewithal, though, to conduct foreign policy. Otherwise, when we encourage nations to to be free and be democratic, they can't support themselves without some help. Thank you. First of all, um, I had the pleasure of meeting a uh, Air Force colonel at the time who was a JAG officer who served in Kosovo. And uh, I heard some great stories about you from him. I doubt if you know his name. But he was involved in nation building after he had figured out where to drop bombs. And he helped. Uh, constitute the uh, legislative authority there. Mm. And he was later tasked to uh, Geneva and was involved in the arrest and prosecution of war crime criminals. He's probably, and I, I want to compliment you on your service there in Kosovo, but this JAG officer is probably the only bright spot I can point to in the military today. I frankly don't trust the military. And the reason why I don't trust it is not because of the armed forces, the people who actually are the boots on the ground or the grunts doing the work. It seems to me that the government has subcontracted way too much of what I consider to be military work. It's, uh, I guess, a class of warriors who are no longer in the military who um, farm themselves out as mercenaries to run prisons of across, around the world. I don't see how Americans can stand up in this world today uh, with the CIA and the report on uh, torture. I know a former CIA agent bureaucrat who was involved in Lord knows what, but he bragged that there was a group within the CIA who, regardless of whatever administration came in, uh, they had their own agenda and they just had to maneuver their way around the bureaucracy. I frankly don't trust the military uh, today to do the right thing. Can we get a Second, question, well, please? What do you see in that regard? What can be done to, to, to change that viewpoint, if you will? And secondly, I don't trust business any longer. After what happened 10 years ago, I find it difficult to accept a business group that doesn't take pride in doing work in America and are willing to go overseas and lower wages and make sure that people cannot have a middle class lifestyle any longer. What can you do? I don't think your book addresses that necessarily. Oh, I think it does. Could you please sure. elaborate on that? I Thank don't know. you. Maybe Thanks. you've already read my book, but if you haven't, read it. I think you'll see it's all in the book and in terms of the business community. Now, let me just address a couple of things. First, I don't think that extreme interrogation techniques have been proven to work. I've talked to people who, who are, have been on the inside and they uh, support uh, Senator Feinstein's view that they don't work. Uh, I've talked to FBI, I've talked to Secret Service people, I've talked to people who had access to the reports. Uh, might make you feel good to think they're really treating them rough, but that's really not why people talk. 
Not even the fear of being treated rough makes people talk. They don't, they don't talk. They talk because you've got to change their minds and make them open up. So I'm glad the report was released. I'm not worried in the long term about its impact abroad, although maybe people will use it against the United States in the short term. I was against what I knew was going on in torture and rough treatment. Um, I got calls from reporters as early as 2003 and 2004 warning me this was going on. Uh, but this was condoned in legal approval by the Bush administration. And uh, there were people inside the agency who were very worried about it, but, uh, but the people in the Department of Justice under George W. Bush produced documents that uh, gave them the authority to do most of what they did. And uh, that's a problem that has to be addressed, and it hasn't been. Uh, I think the military, the top leadership of the military is outstanding. Now, I might be prejudiced because I know them, and a lot of them worked for me. Marty Dempsey, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I'm proud to say he was a student of mine at West Point, 1973-74. Ray Odiernos, Chief of Staff of the Army, he was a colonel working for me. Uh, when I was running Kosovo, he was in the mud in Albania with Task Force Hawk with a bunch of Apache helicopters. So I got to know Ray extremely well then, and he's a very smart, capable, and honest man who's a great public servant. We've got in the habit of contracting out a lot of stuff that shouldn't be contracted out. We've been afraid to increase the size of the military. And what, what, what if we said this? What if we said that if we go to war again, we have to declare it and we have to initiate a draft and let the American people vote on it? And then, you know, if you don't want your sons and daughters in war, vote against the war. Don't leave it up to volunteers and, and poor folks from Arkansas and Kansas who don't have any other alternatives and need medical help for their family. Say, well, I'm just going to go into the Army and take my chances over there because that's what's happened. So uh, had we had a Selective Service Act in place and people actually being drafted, we'd have been out of Iraq and Afghanistan a long time ago, and we've had better results had we done it. But part of your lack of trust might just have to do with maturity and experience in life, you know. I mean, Ben Franklin said most people are interested mostly in themselves, and we've made a virtue in the business community of people, um, well, I mean, Gordon Gecko said greed is good. And uh, we think the invisible hand solves many problems in America. And what we're seeing is that over a period of 30 years where we've turned that invisible hand loose and allowed more free reign to greed and self-serving in the economy, it hasn't helped the country nearly as much as we hoped it would. So I think there's some reckoning to be done in the political uh, times ahead, and I think people have to look real hard at what it means to have a free market, what it means to, to have stakeholders in a business as opposed to shareholders in a business, and what the responsibilities of businesses are. I, I learned this firsthand. I was in a conference in Vienna about two years ago, and I was talking about the economic crisis, and I said, you know, the reason we have banks is because they help the public. I mean, they're chartered. They're national banks or state banks. They're chartered to help the public. Afterwards, my friend, who was a big banker at, at a big European bank, came to me and said, I liked everything you said, except I violently disagree about what you said about banks. They do not exist to help the public. They exist to make a profit. Hmm. I never thought of it that way. But if you think that's the purpose of these institutions, then you have to ask, why do you have, you know, corporations uh, organized under law? Why do you have limited liability companies and so forth? Because it serves the public interest, not the private interest. So we're going to have to have a reckoning on that in the political discourse in America. It's going to take several election cycles. But I do believe in democracy. And I do believe that an intelligent people look at the world around them, they look at their system of government, and they do eventually make the right choices. They may not make it the first time, they may not make it the second time, but after all alternatives have been exhausted, all other alternatives, in democracy, people will make the right choice. That's my faith. Thank you for coming this evening. Would you, you say something about the future of cooperative uh, 
strategic groups like NATO, with all the changes that are happening, places like Turkey and so on. Would you say something about the future of those cooperative forces? Sure. Well, organizations like NATO have always been about to break apart. From the time NATO was formed, there have been nothing but problems. When Eisenhower went over there in 1951-52 as the first commander of NATO, the first report on NATO he wrote back to the White House, to Harry Truman, was, these countries like Britain and France, they're not doing their job. They promised X number of divisions. They're not delivering on their promises. And from then on, there's been one challenge after another for the alliance. In, 1960, in 1956, after we brought West Germany into NATO, there was a huge crisis in Britain and France invaded Egypt to punish Nasser and take back the Suez Canal. Russia threatened a sea of fire on America. And Eisenhower told the British and French, get out of Egypt. People said, that's the end of NATO. Well, it wasn't the end. You know, in 1974, Turkey and Greece went to war over Cyprus. People said, it's the end of NATO. Well, when I was a NATO Supreme Allied Commander in 1997, guess what we were still arguing about? Airspace between Greece and Turkey. It had been going on, an argument that had been going on for over 25 years, still going on. And it's probably still going on today. But NATO has endured. In 1968, people said, NATO will never make it because we didn't respond when the Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia and crushed the spring. No, we didn't. Uh, but NATO survived. In 1977-78, we recognized that the Soviets were using SS-20 missiles, and they had completely changed the nuclear equation. You see, deterrence only works if you can match tit for tat. So if he's got strategic missiles, you've got to have strategic missiles. He's got artillery missile-fired nukes, you've got to have artillery-fired nukes. If he's got intermediate missiles, you've got to have intermediate missiles. The Europeans were dead set against what we called nuclear modernization. We pushed it. Uh, we forced it, and we negotiated the zero-zero option, so we never actually had to deploy them. And the Russians pulled theirs back, and NATO survived. When the Soviet Union fell apart, people said it's the end of NATO. And yet, NATO survived. It was extremely important in the Balkans. We couldn't have done it without it. After that, the Europeans said, we're tired of America telling us what to do. We're going to build our own organization. But of course, the Europeans didn't. NATO's still there. And now, Turkey's a problem. Let's be honest. It's been a problem for a while. We've used it, uh, but we've also abused Turkey. We promised Turkey they'd be brought into the European Union. We couldn't deliver on that promise. Um, and instead, we can't diplomacy against Turkey again and again and again. And now we have a man in, in President Erdogan, who's both a Turkish nationalist and a, um, he, he's overturning the secularism of Turkey. And some people say, and I see I'm being recorded back here, so uh, I'm not sure who's here. <laughs> Is this the press? They're all friendly. No press? Well, yeah, they're huh? press, but the university press. Okay. University press. So, I mean, there are some people who say, uh, including Vice President Biden who said it, that Turkey was involved in, in ISIS. Uh, now he later apologized and retracted it, um, but I'm not sure. What I hear on the Arab Street is Turkey's deeply involved in ISIS because they don't want Iran and Syria to link up and encircle Turkey. And, um, and so uh, ISIS is dribbling all the way through eastern Turkey, and it's a real problem for NATO and for Turkey. So uh, we're going to solve this problem. NATO is going to be around a long, long time. It is the indispensable linkage between the United States and Europe. It's a group of nations bound together by the pledge that an attack on one is an attack on all. It's a legal pledge, and the United States will respond to an attack on Estonia or Bulgaria or Romania or any other NATO member. We will. We may not want to. The American people may not be able to find it on the map. But that's our legal obligation, and President Obama has affirmed that we will. 
And as we move forward and face the challenge of China, we're going to need NATO even more. The United States needs the help of Europe to manage the ascent of China. The Chinese are going to want things their own way. We're going to want a gradual transition, and we're going to accommodate their rise to power. But we're not going to throw out all the progress we've made over two centuries in international law, peaceful settlement of disputes, uh, human rights, and other things. So they're going to have to accommodate us as well. We'll be a lot more effective explaining this to the Chinese if we have Europe on our side. And the best way to keep Europe on our side, I really like a transatlantic free trade agreement, but that's not the way to keep Europe on our side. The way to keep Europe on our side is NATO. So we're going to keep NATO strong. We're going to strengthen it. We're going to need it. Uh, if we don't, God help us. So we need those organizations. You all have been terrific. I thank you so much for coming out on a Friday night. I'm very honored by your presence. I want to thank the Clinton Center for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. I hope you will read my book. And, sir, hope it'll, it'll trigger your thoughts. And, and it, I've got answers on your business questions. Thank you.